The content of this podcast is based on medical fact and evidence-based practice from credible authoritative sources, but is not a substitute for your institution's policies, procedures, common sense, or good judgment. The views and opinions are those of Eric Bauer and Flight Bridge Ed in their entirety. This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hey everybody, Eric back with you. It has been a minute. Been working really hard the last three or four months on completely revamping, redoing, trying to stretch our abilities um, and really come out with a completely new version of the review course. Uh, We did launch the new vent course that's had a lot of great reviews. And so the new review course will actually launch on the 15th of February. Pretty excited about that. And so um, check that out. Today's podcast is going to be Hidden Harms. Refractory shock in pre-hospital trauma patients. We're going to start off with a nightmare case and look at the impacts that are hidden. Uh, Just want to really broaden our critical thinking and think about these little nuances that we might not think about. Let's imagine we have a 58-year-old male. We arrive on scene, basically land on the freeway, long extrication time. Uh, looks like he rear-ended a tractor trailer. We have about a 30-minute extrication. He's got multiple long bone fractures. Looks like he has an unstable pelvis. Definitely shortening and rotation to the right leg. Definitely a femur fracture present. Uh, assessing his airway. Remember, we, we don't assess based on Glasgow Coma Scale. I know it's really easy to always think of that, but we look at, can they follow commands? Can they control their secretions? And what is their anticipated clinical course? Feel a radial pulse and you cannot identify any pulse whatsoever. So you go down and go to your femoral and you are able to feel a femoral pulse and it's approximately 130 to 135. SPO2, 90%, once you get him out of the car. And you have to make the determination, does he fit the criteria of needing resuscitative sequence innovation? And you determine, after conferring with your partner, that you definitely need to go down that road. So remember, it's all about making good clinical decisions with your pharmacology and that we have to evaluate this patient from an airway standpoint. We don't use the lemons mnemonic anymore for airway difficulty evaluation, but we do use the heaven criteria. And remember the heaven criteria is, is the patient hypoxic? Is there any visible hemorrhage or any sanguination that you perceive based on mechanism? Is there any anatomic disruption? Do you have any vomit blood secretions in the airway? Is the patient larger, right? Do you have an extreme head, no neck? And do you have any neck mobility issues that you anticipate? Remember, the heaven criteria really is twofold. Number one, it's a way to evaluate the patient from resuscitation. And we got to slow down when we manage these patients' airways. It's important to remember we have to establish that airway, but even if it takes you an extra 10 minutes to resuscitate, to fill the tank, to ensure you get this patient a definitive care, we definitely don't want any peri-arrest, let alone an arrest after you perform this resuscitative sequence innovation. So you got to think about what type of shock index does this patient have? Well, a couple really easy ways to evaluate shock index. If you have a tachycardic patient in trauma, and you look at this patient from the standpoint of, do I check a blood pressure? Or is it even needed to check a blood pressure in the initial stage of trauma? And I would say no. I would say, remember, 30 to 40% blood loss before you ever see a drop in blood pressure. So 
probably not going to give you a good, clear indication of what's going on. And I would say if you do our pulse checks, I know that a radial is not definitively a 90 systolic. All right? There's definitely been evidence to show that that probably isn't as solid as we once thought. But for me, that's good enough. If I know I have a radial, I'm going to say 90, you could say 100. Remember, if your systolic is 100 and your heart rate is over 100, that's a shock index of 1. So we're looking for anything greater than 0.9 on our shock index. And when we think about this patient, heart rate of 138, that is a clinical sign of decompensation. So going back to our shock index, evaluating this, we have a femoral pulse using the old method of determining, hey, this is probably a systolic of 70 minimum heart rate of 138. That's a shock index of 1.9. But again, remember, your heart rate over 100, assume your blood pressure is less than 100. That's a shock index of 1, and you meet that criteria. So we know we have to think about if we're going to use ketamine as our induction agent, the standard dose range is 1 to 2 milligrams per kilo. We need to lower that by half. So go 1 milligram per kilo, Start evaluating this patient from a volume resuscitation standpoint. Even if you give this patient 500 mils of warm fluid to start off, we know that this patient likely needs blood products, definitely falls into the criteria of needing blood products, but we need to fill the tank, get something on board. So we give our ketamine, we're going to go one milligram per kilo. We're going to go rocuronium. Remember, any adult patient needs to have a dose range of 1 to 1.5 1 milligrams per kilo. We're going to go 1.5 milligrams per kilo on this patient. And remember, from the standpoint of assessment, passive oxygenation, right? We need to start that passive oxygenation well before we give an induction agent. We're going to give 15 liters by nasal cannula. Use a non rebreather as our second source at 15 to 25 liters per minute and drive up that SpO2 as high as we can, optimize that nitrogen washout, drive up that PaO2, give yourself a little time. Always make sure you have your BVM out and ready. Have your entitled CO2 between your mask and your BVM. Have it ready to go. Doesn't mean we have to bag our patient. Make sure you have a PEEP valve on. Remember, 5 to 10 a PEEP is the starting number. You perform successful intubation, right? We'll, we'll get first pass success. You used a video laryngoscope view. And so intubation went uneventful. But we were never able to get that blood pressure up to a safe number, right? MAPS have maintained less than 60. You have now moved towards the aircraft and you have lifted. You have a good entitled CO2 waveform, but you're consistently getting entitled CO2s around 23 to 24. Current blood pressure is 62 over 42, heart rate of 132, and SpO2 of 94%. You have transitioned this patient over to the Hamilton T1. You have this patient in SIMV uh, pressure. You have a tidal volume. This patient is approximately... 5 foot 10, so tidal volume of 420 mils, rate of 16, PEEP of 5, right? Simple stuff. Can't get the blood pressure up though. So we got to think about why is that happening? Definitely haven't started blood products yet. So you, we do give a unit of fresh plasma and make sure this is warmed. You then give a total of two units of O positive packed red blood cells obviously warmed, and you notice no change in blood pressure. You're in a pretty rural area, and so flight time is 45 minutes to your level one trauma center. You actually have a third unit of blood products. You're going to start a third unit of packed red blood cells, and still no real change in pressure. So what's going on here? This is a really big deal in a lot of patients, and I think it's often missed what's going on, right? We, we automatically attribute this to volume loss. Very well could be the direct 
problem. But we got to also consider, is this patient vasoplegic? What does that mean? Vasoplegia is essentially a condition that is characterized by persistent low SVR, despite normal or high cardiac index or cardiac output. And so it results in profound, uncontrolled vasodilation. Why does this happen? Well, it can happen for lots of reasons. It can happen as a secondary result of trauma, like we're seeing here. It can happen secondarily to sepsis, or you know, maybe this patient has cardiac failure. Maybe this patient just had just a, a routine surgery. But what is the underlying cause? Well, the underlying cause really is these home medications that they're on. And I don't think we do a good enough job really in the scene flight setting. And I, and I mean that in, in all humility, right? It's not that we're not wanting to find out this information. It's often difficult, as you guys know. We don't readily have family right there. It's not something that we have a list that's handed to us very often. And let's be honest, these patients are often unresponsive. Maybe they're already innovated when we arrive on scene. And so it's really difficult to get a good history, let alone identify their home meds. But there's a group of medications that we have to be really cognizant of. So the first medication to consider are these ARB medications. Those are angiotensin II blocking agents. Losartan is the most commonly prescribed ARB medication. And you got to think about what, what type of patient What's the age range? What's that demographic? Well, I would say any male or female over 40 years old, you should automatically be thinking potentially could be being treated for just a central hypertension. Well, we know that our blood pressure is regulated first off based on that angiotensin renin cycle. So any drug that is going to alter or affect our ability to regulate that cycle can cause this issue. Number two, ACE inhibitors. Number one prescribed first-line medication in new onset hypertension is lisinopril. And so, again, are they able to compensate? What about simple beta blockade? We know beta blockers are also often prescribed in that initial new onset hypertension. Maybe the provider doesn't feel like an ACE inhibitor is going to be the best option. So low dose beta blockade. Are you able to increase your heart rate in a compensatory situation? And lastly, what about calcium channel blockers? Norvasc is the most popular calcium channel blocker prescribed for these patients. Again, think about what does the direct ability and the effect on vasoconstriction? Are we able to vasoconstrict when we need to? And so any combination of these medications, even a simple ACE inhibitor can cause vasoplegia in a volume situation like this. And so if the patient is non-responsive, you need to start looking at what are potential causes. So I would even say that if you have any insight or are told about any of these home medications prior, maybe you go to the extent of using push dose pressors, right? That is something we haven't talked about. I purposely did not put that in that initial uh, resuscitation scenario. It's definitely warranted in that early stage to consider push dose pressors, right? But what do we have available to us? Whether you identify this early on or after this patient's refractory, all the volume, all the blood that you've given, got to do something to drive that map up to a level that's going to perfuse the patient. So remember, we have three different push dose pressors. Whether all of these are within your shop Right, we can use vasopressin one to two units every two to three minutes in trauma works really well. Think about Epi. Epi is a popular push dose presser, five to twenty mics every one to five minutes. 
or phenylephrine is another go-to of maybe 50 to 200 mics every one to five minutes. But it could be one of those things that you identify early on and say, hey, this patient's on an ACE inhibitor, on an ARB, maybe on a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor as well. They could potentially have difficulties. And so maybe you start giving that push dose presser early in the resuscitation. There's definitely multiple cases out there where patients are refractory in just standard general surgery situations. They're on ACE inhibitors. And we know that, you know, maybe they're volume depleted and it takes five, six, seven, eight liters of fluid sometimes to bring their pressure up. So this is definitely an area that we should consider. Comes back to clinical decision-making about being that detective. We've talked about that on so many podcasts. Try to think ahead Make this now a consideration. Put this as a consideration in your toolbox and think about, can I identify any potential issues prior? What's the age of my patient? Do they fall in to that range where they could be being treated for just standard essential hypertension? Ask about medications if you can. Try to Figure that stuff out prior to where you can maybe react a little bit better. Again, I definitely understand in the scene flight setting, very difficult. But remember, this can happen in sepsis. This can happen in a lot of different scenarios. So make this a consideration and start looking at the patient's home medications on these transfers. If they're refractory hypotensive, regardless of what you're doing, and you look on their home meds and they're on an ARB, they're on calcium channel blocker, well, then that probably is something to consider from a contributing factor, and you might need to be a little bit more aggressive with your resuscitation. Hopefully this podcast was something you can add to your tool bag. As always, if you have any ideas for future podcasts, please email me, eric.bauer at flybridgehead.com, and I will talk to you soon. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, leading the way in pre-hospital critical care and emergency medicine education.